G'day, it's Shane Dillon from the website kangarooquarteroftheaustralia.com. Now, I've just interviewed David McBride. He's a former army officer and also a qualified lawyer. And he's probably best known for being a war crimes whistleblower. But the interview is in relation to the National Anti-Corruption Commission. And I thought it would be good to get his uh, viewpoint, given that he's a lawyer and also has a good understanding of secret hearings. G'day, it's Shane Dillon here from kangarooquarteroftheaustralia.com. I'm here with uh, David McBride, former... Australian Army officer and also qualified lawyer. And we're going to be talking about the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which has just passed the Parliament, both houses, the lower house and upper house, uh, this week. Uh, my viewpoint is it's a bit of a dud. It's not going to achieve much. It's good to have it passed. It is, it is functioning now and it'll be set up early next year. It's meant to start in the middle of next year, but I don't think it's going to achieve much. What do you think there, David? No, I don't think it's going to achieve anything. In fact, if anything, it's going to be negative because it gives the appearance of fighting corruption, but the reality, it won't actually fight any corruption at all. Well, that's probably one of the benefits for the government. It's their fallback position. Any corruption gets raised, they say, oh, the National Anti-Corruption Commission is looking at it. Can't comment. <laughs> yeah, that's or right. I can say our promise was to uh, put in a, a knack, and we've done that. Um, and uh, it won't be in till the middle of next year. It won't be doing anything proper till the next election, and so they get away with saying they've done something uh, when actually they haven't. One of the issues is obviously, well, the key issue is that the, all the hearings are going to be in private, except for exceptional circumstances. Now, they made up a lot of lies. It, it just doesn't stack up. Anyone in the legal fraternity knows open courts is a key to keeping everyone honest, everyone accountable. Um, the Attorney General is a qualified barrister, Mark Dreyfus. So he knows that open courts is a foundation of accountability. And closed courts, well, that uh, means everyone's going to start questioning it. But so does Peter Dutton. He's a former police officer, nine years as a police officer. He knows what open courts are about, how it keeps everyone accountable. But both of them have made up all these out-and-out -out lies, dribbly arguments, about all you could call it, to justify the secret hearings. How do you find some of those arguments they put forward? Yeah, it's rubbish. And I think one of the most telling, and Peter Dutton would know this <laughs> from his uh, experience in court as a uh, policeman, there's the, the most telling thing is that the Liberal Party were absolutely against uh, any kind of accountability uh, for politicians. Now, they have agreed to this, uh, uh, this body wholeheartedly overnight. Now, that to me, they wouldn't have changed their opinion overnight. Uh, that can only mean that they know this body is toothless and they have nothing to fear from it. Um, as you said, there there is no, it's all behind closed doors, and guess who's going to be in charge of it? Someone appointed by the Labor Party, only by the Labor Party, um, and uh, they will make everything secret. Uh, they will make sure everything is sort of very softly, softly, and... Um, no one will be the wiser. The only it'll be hand-picked uh, people who come before it. People who the government. Uh, there might even be some Labor people, but there will undoubtedly be the Labor people who have fallen out with the party. It'll be a way to punish uh, traitors. Uh, everyone will be hand-picked, and uh, nothing will be known by the public. So it really is um, not what they told us it was going to be. Well, I think the obvious comparisons are is Victoria, who have the IBAC, uh, Independent Broad-Based uh, Anti-Corruption Commission, and New South Wales, which have the ICAC, Independent Commission Against Corruption. Now, the ICAC, they investigated the Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, and she resigns before the public hearing. Whereas in Victoria, the Premier, Daniel Andrews, has been before the IBAC four times, apparently, over the last three, four years. And we've never seen his answers. We've never seen what he's been investigated for. We know virtually nothing about it. He stays in power. Now, if that same scenario with IBAC in 
Victoria, who rarely have public hearings because they've got the restriction of uh, exceptional circumstances as well. That scenario had it been in New South Wales, well, Flatesbury Jicklin would still be Premier. And you yeah. have to wonder if you had public hearings in Victoria, would Danielle Andrews still be Premier? Yeah, you're right. And the three the three big scouts, um, not just Berejiklian, but Barry O'Farrell and Nick Griner, uh, they all came uh, from embarrassment uh, when the public uh, found out about what these guys get up to behind closed doors. There was no charges. It's very hard to bring something to make sure charges. The police were not keen on doing it. You won't get a conviction, but public embarrassment's enough. And as you said, look, yeah, Andrews has been there a few times uh, and he's just got it re-elected for the third time. <laughs> it's a great analogy and it makes the point very, uh, very clearly. Well, well, the thing is that uh, if Gladys Berejiklian had nothing to hide, she would have just stood aside as Premier, allowed the investigation to be completed, then gone back to being Premier. But she knew... One of the big things is when she hopped in the witness stand, her answers just weren't credible. Her credibility was destroyed by the answers that she gave. She was, uh, her body language, she was doing the big puffer fish, they called it, where she, her lips were going like that, like a big puffer fish when she was coming in. She was very nervous, not credible. Now, if she had known she had credible answers or justifiable reasons for doing what she's doing, she would have just stayed as a politician and come back as Premier. But the fact that she knew her answers weren't going to be credible is the reason she resigned. Yeah, no, it's it, 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 the public hearings are the weapon of ICAC. Um, uh, you can imagine even if, even if she'd been so-called cleared, uh, her career was over. Now, um, and that is because uh, the, the public put that to the test, and I think that that's the absolute beauty of it. Um, and we can't afford to lose that. They, um, it's the one time, and this is why I wanted to have a trial of my own case, when they're in the witness box, it's the one time they don't have their spin doctors, they don't have their paid um, media flax, um, the, the people that they're, you know, on side. Like the, the, the Sydney Morning Herald ran hero worshipping uh, stories about Gladys, how she'd saved the state, if not the world, yeah. you know. And then once uh, people saw her bumbling and mumbling about her boyfriend and sending billions of dollars down to Wagga so he could get re elected, people thought, what? You know, it, it melted away all that hero worship stuff. Um, and uh, that's why we need it, because they, they never face hard questions outside the witness box. Um, and as I said, this is one of the reasons why I want a trial. They never even... Um, uh, everything is stage managed. Everything is... Um, they, they just don't answer the question. And um, you could have asked the same questions to Gladys outside of IOK, and she just would have ignored them. Well, she did. Um, she was getting asked similar questions beforehand, and she was ducking and weaving mm. because someone and, leaked a lot of the details. Yeah, and she was like, oh, I don't need to be here. And good on Ruth McColl, um, former uh, uh, judge, um, Supreme Court judge, and she was able to uh, uh, say... No, Miss Burgess, <laughs> don't roll your eyes like you don't have to be here. You do have to be here and you do have to answer the question. And they never get told that anywhere else apart from there. And, and as you said, that sunk her. Not any finding, uh, not any criminal charges. That sunk her because finally the people could see exactly who she was. Well, the ultimate test is a public hearing test. Um the most powerful test, I suppose, is a better way to explain it, is a public hearing test. But I want to get back to Daniel Andrews. There's two two issues there. One, how that we can sort of look at what he ha happened with him and how that will impact on a federal government, uh, the federal election. But two, is it constitutional? Because he's gone to a, an election. The eye back there, a report has been leaked to the media showing that he's under investigation for giving $3.4 to a health workers' union. 
and which is a suspect grant, but he's been able to go to an election with his big cloud hanging over him and the public have not been able to see that information, even though it goes to the heart of his uh, position as a politician, his suitability as a politician. Um, so you have to wonder if it's constitutional for them to do that because it's not just a timing factor, it's a political factor where they've legislated to make sure that information doesn't become public. And you have a thing called Longy versus ABC where the public are entitled to information that goes to the suitability of politicians, uh, their suitability to be a politician. So you have to wonder if that could be challenged from a constitutional viewpoint, um, the federal one and also the Victorian one because they're withholding information. They, like, we don't know what's in that report, but we're going to find out in the next couple of months. And that could have uh, impacted on not only his re-election, but re-election of the government as a whole. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's a good question. I think it's a very much a rigged casino and you'd struggle to get up with challenging it. But I, I, I um, agree with you and I'd, I would say this. If you and I uh, get charged, not that we would ever get charged with anything, uh, we have to face public hearings and uh, we uh, we are judged um, whether or not we get acquitted or not. Uh, the public, it, it's reported in the press uh, and the public are allowed to make their decisions. Now, that is a principle of our uh, country. Now, and you'd think, well, why would politicians be uh, allowed to, to, to be measured by a different standard? And, of course, it's actually quite the opposite. There's no real reason for the public to know all the details of your life or my life. Um, but there is a very good reason for the public to know all the details um, of a, a politician's life and in, in that they, things that could affect uh, whether they can be bribed and whether or not they're trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense that politicians should be able to uh, be investigated uh, and have their hearings in secret, whereas you and I and every other Australian, we get judged in public. Now, there's no justification for that. Well, one of the things about Dan Andrews, looking at federally, because the federal uh, NAC, National Anti-Corruption Commission, is going to operate the same, similar way to IBAC, where there's going to be very few public hearings, it's highly probable and highly likely at the next federal election that there wouldn't have been any public hearings because the NAC, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, would have only been up and running about 12 or 18 months. And so they probably wouldn't have had any public hearings and they're going to be restricted anyhow. So we'll go to the next federal election with multiple MPs under investigation for alleged corruption, but they're still going to Keep, be keeping their position, potentially ministers, potentially even a prime minister, who knows, or former prime minister, um, under investigation, the public's not going to be able to know that. And that's uh, and that obviously goes to the heart of their suitability to be a federal politician. So, And that's not by accident, that's by design. They've designed the National Anti-Corruption Commission that way. So, so I, I think federally there probably is potentially a legal challenge. Like you said, it mightn't succeed, but we're entitled to know that information before we vote on these people, and we're not going to know, one. And two, can you imagine the rumours that are going to be around? Everyone will be dropping a rumour that they're under investigation, I suspect, and well, people aren't going to be able to that, confirm or deny it. Well, that's right. Unfortunately, we've seen, I think, one of the big things that have come out of... Um, the last couple of weeks and the passing of this bill, as you pointed out, people like you and I were prepared to give the Albanese government the benefit of the doubt. Uh, that benefit of the doubt has been removed now. They could have passed the NAC bill without the support of the Liberals and the Nationals, uh, who it's widely agreed was the most corrupt federal government that this country has ever seen. Now, they went, um, rather than go to the independents and the Greens to pass this bill, they went to the Liberals and the Nationals and they bonded together with them. Now, that makes it clear 
to everyone in Australia that Albanese and Dutton have more in common um, than with each other than they do with the average Australian. There can be no doubt about that now. They are working together to entrench corruption rather than actually fight corruption. They had nothing, they did not want anything to do with any amendments proposed by Helen Haynes, uh, David Pocock, David Shoebridge, all honest, uh, independent, small party members. Uh, they preferred uh, to get into bed with uh, Dutton and Albert, and with Dutton, who was clearly a very uh, questionable character. Uh, and But that's who they are. Labor, Liberal, Nationals, they're all the one party. Now, I wanted to talk about the element, the whistleblower element, the protections in there. But they're also talking about protections as a whole for whistleblowers, not just with the NAC. And uh, pretty much how hypocritical it is, because one of the key things that I believe protect whistleblowers are public hearings. It's all private. The whistleblower is going in there with no protection of the public uh, backing them up. So it's really a sucker punch to say, oh, we've legislated to protect uh, whistleblowers, but it's all going to be done in private, so we're not going to even know if the whistleblowers are getting protected or not. So how yeah, 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 no, do you feel about that? It's like, it's like a trap. You saw uh, Mark Dreyfus on Good Morning TV yesterday say, all we want is for people to come forward and make complaints to their organisation. If their organisation doesn't hear them, they should be allowed to go to the media. Uh, and at the same time, he's prosecuting me and, and Richard Well and trying to put us in jail forever. Um, now, that sums up the, that man. They don't really want to protect whistleblowers. They want you to report yourself so you can be prosecuted. Um as you said, whistleblowers don't want protection. People like myself and Richard Boyle were so angry with the corruption we saw in our own departments. We want accountability. We don't want protection. Put me in jail. As long as you also put the former Chief of the Defence Force on trial, um, I want accountability. I don't want protection. And uh, the problem is... Um, there is no accountability. They never talk about that. That's what whistleblowers want. We want to see some action on the corruption that we have pointed out. Uh, we are prepared to go to jail for it. We are prepared to have our lives ruined for it. But we want to see action. And, of course, that's the one thing that Dreyfus um, refuses to talk about. He doesn't want action against the government on whistleblower protection. What the hell does that mean? Um, we want to see accountability for those who get paid large amounts of money to put the national interest above the self-interest. And if they don't do it, the police should be knocking on their door. Well, that's the bottom line, isn't it? And they're, they're talking big about protection of whistleblowers while at the same time prosecuting yourself and Richard Boyle and sending a message to whistleblowers, shut your mouths, otherwise this is what happens to you. Yeah, uh, you, you no doubt. I mean, you'd, you'd be a fool to be a whistleblower today unless you were, you know, totally committed like me. It's taken me 10 years. Uh, I've had to raise money myself. I've lost my job. I lost my marriage. I just about lost my life. Uh, and... Yeah, unless you're prepared for that, you don't become a whistleblower. Mark Dreyfus will let you die in prison before he does anything, and he will actually go on Good Morning TV saying, I love whistleblowers. And then when you say, well, what about me? He'll say something like, you're not a whistleblower, you're a criminal. You know, it's just pathetic. Mm -hmm. So just quickly, uh, Richard Boyle, to my knowledge, uh, his case where it's at is that the uh, judge has reserved his decision or her decision in relation to whether it should be thrown out because he's a, he's applied to have it thrown out on the basis that he's a whistleblower. Is that your knowledge to where his case is at? Because it's pretty pretty well like yours. A lot of it's in secret, so you don't really know. <laughs> yeah, that shows you how pathetic 
uh, our government has become. I mean, unlike me, uh, Richard Ball worked in the tax office. Now, they, the government applied for suppression orders as if uh, the goings-on uh, of the South Australian uh, tax office uh, were some sort of like national security elements that China would be able to use against us. I mean... The suppression orders would drop, but there's still a lot of secrecy in, involved in it. The case hasn't been uh, covered uh, particularly widely, and that can only be because of the government pressure. Yes, it, the, the judgment's been reserved. Uh, the act, it, it, it shows you how ridiculous it is. Even, even Dreyfus himself knows that the act, which Boyle has been tried under, is highly flawed and needs to be changed. Now, you think that then the government departments wouldn't be wasting their time and money prosecuting on someone, someone under an act which they know is flawed um, from their own mouths. But, yes, they're going to keep prosecuting him under the old act, which they know is flawed because even Dreyfus says it's flawed and he's going to try and change it. But Boyle will be judged on the flawed act. Uh, whether he meets all sorts of criteria, like did he wait six months? Did he, before he made a complaint, did he complain to the right person? That's what they were trying with me. Oh, you know, you might be complaining about the Holocaust, but if you didn't complain to the the public interest disclosure delegate as appointed by the Defence Force and you actually complained to your supervisor, um, therefore your complaint will fail, even if it's about the deaths of thousands of people. Um, that's how pathetic the government is. The government run this program as if they're the criminals. Uh, and people like myself and Boyle talk about big issues of accountability, uh, lawful actions, um, murders. We talk about big issues of uh, democratic government, whereas the government says things like, we don't want to talk about that. We're not going to answer that question. Oh, what's the definition of... Uh, a reportable offence, what's the definition of the right person, did you get it within the time frames? They take all the technicalities that you would expect a career criminal to take if they were ever charged with a serious offence. Um, I used to say in a bit of a throwaway line I wanted to put the government on trial, but it definitely looks like I am putting the government on trial, as is Boyle, in that I'm talking about big, broad issues of law and accountability, and they are scurrying around like rats talking about um, the sort of things that criminals might say in order to avoid conviction. That is eventually taking the right to silence, um, you, questioning the definitions, questioning technicalities, um, all to avoid actually looking at the big issues. Well, that's what they do. They, um, they know, like you said, they know the legislation that Boyle's being charged under doesn't stack up and they're talking about changing it, yet they're following through with the prosecution and there can only be one reason to send a message to other whistleblowers. This is what happens if you come forward because both your, your complaints is obviously war crimes investigation, people under investigation now, had the Brereton report, so it's been legitimised. You, the issues you've raised has been found to be a fact that the legitimate issues. Uh, same with Boyle, yet they continue with the prosecution. So that's sending a message to whistleblowers. Even if you've got a legitimate issue, we're going to come after you anyhow. We'll turn the, turn it around. And that's yeah. what they can do with the National Anti-Corruption Commission because no one will know what's happening. All of a sudden, there's a prosecution of a whistleblower <laughs> and well, we know nothing more. We had that happened exactly that happened in Queensland. Um, uh, there was a um, uh, general manager of a council and uh, she uh, reported uh, to the, I think it's called the Triple C in Queensland, um, this, uh, giving evidence against her mayor to say, oh, this mayor is corrupt, you know, and uh, she gave evidence in secret but, uh, about why the mayor was corrupt. Uh, next thing you know, she gets sacked by the council, um, and uh, so uh, and then she has a, a terrible time trying to get reinstated. Even though she said the only reason they sacked me was because I gave evidence, um, 
and I gave evidence because it was the right thing to do, but it came out that I was giving evidence against the mayor. The next thing you know, I'm sacked by the mayor's cronies, and she she's had a hell of a time trying to get a job back when it was clearly a retribution for her giving evidence. So that's right. These secret hearings, the politicians will know who's talked to um, the NAC. The public won't know. And then who knows what's going to happen to the poor old person who gave evidence to the NAC. Um, their life, you never know. The, the AFP will be coming in and investigating them next. And um, uh, their life will be made a misery. The AFP believe they work for the government. They don't believe they work for the nation. They don't believe anything the government does is wrong. So if the government sends them out to Joe Bloggs's place to search his place for information or documents, which the person might have been used to giving evidence to ICAC, uh, the AFP are going to arrest that witness to ICAC or NAC and they're going to prosecute him and the, the CDPP, they're going to put him in jail or her. And... Um, so, yeah, be careful trying to do the right thing in this country. You will end up behind bars uh, before any politicians will. Just quickly, uh, we've only got a 40-minute limit on Zoom. Um, I'll just cancel that. I've just had a pop-up. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, where, where's your case at currently and sort of when is there a date set for a final hearing or...? No, we haven't got a date yet. We'll get a date uh, next year. Uh, it will presumably be uh, late in 2023, which is uh, in some ways a sort of a, uh, interesting day. It will be exactly 10 years um, in, tw in September 2023 when I first uh, decided something was very wrong uh, in the Australian Defence Force and that uh, the Minister of Defence's office and something needed to be done about it. Uh, I'm not complaining. Uh, it's the greatest battle I've ever had to fight in my life and I'm enjoying it. But it will... Um, I've changed my... You know, I used to think I would definitely win on the law, especially in front of a jury. I now think I'll almost definitely lose because it's not going to come down to the law. Uh, national security will be invoked uh, at every turn. There will be no ability for me to defend myself uh, producing facts. Uh, I have no faith in the jury uh, selection uh, being fair and that they have to have the highest level security clearances and they all come from Canberra. So I guess who's yes. going to be... Um, it's going to be like the Eastern Virginia jury. You know, it's going to be... a I think I'm going to go to jail, but uh, and probably for a very long time. But uh, people like yourself uh, and my supporters around the country, I don't think they're going to accept that. Uh, the test for me now is to hold my head up high, be proud of what I've done, uh, and let people, the public, judge who is who by the, my appearance and my dignity uh, as opposed uh, to the government and their excuses and they're running around um, saying, oh, but, 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 when it looks pretty clear, as you said, uh, if the one person, there's one person that's going to go to jail for the disasters, which was called the global war on terror, and that one person is me, uh, I don't think the public is going to accept that. But um, let's see what the government, are, let's see how they go. They're looking pretty confident now. They're not taking a backward step. So uh, both sides are doubling down, and we'll, and we'll see who's standing in you know, a couple of years' time. That was the thing I'd been thinking about, but you just clarified it then, how bad it is. I thought the jury system would be your saving grace because we've learnt in the Brittany Higgins uh, case that uh, in the ACT it has to be unanimous. And so I thought, well, you only need one dissenting jury member, and you're going to be you're going to be fine. But you just mentioned it then. All the jury members need to have a high security. Um, no, it's a joke, isn't it? They have to have a high security uh, pass or whatever. Yeah. So who's so that going to be? They're going to be predetermined. The jury members. I know it's a joke. Unbelievable it's, that it's, is. The best thing we can do is just present ourselves well and 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 to present me 
facing up to it and uh, really having just done my job and the government with all their like, oh, we love whistleblowers, we love the truths, we hate war crimes and all that, yet somehow I'm going to jail and no one else has even been charged, even the bloke who shot someone on TV. Um, so the public, well, we'll see. The government think they're pretty think they're pretty clever. Uh, we'll see after my trial what the public think about them. Yep. All right. Then we'll leave it there for the moment. Uh, like I said, we only got a 40-minute uh, time limit, but uh, we'll try and catch up again on other subjects. Uh, so thank you for your time, David. Have a good day. Thank you, Shane. Very enjoyable. Thank you for your good work in Kangaroo Court of Australia. Thanks a lot. Christian Porter. Yep, thanks. Now, you can follow and support David McBride on his YouTube channel, his Twitter account, and he's also set up a GoFundMe page to help raise funds to fight his court case. I'll have links to all three below the video on YouTube. And please support my Patreon account. That's how I raise funds to publish these videos and publish the articles on my website, Kangaroo Court of Australia. And please hit the like and subscribe button and share this video on Facebook, Twitter and other social media. Other than that, thank you for your time and have a good day.